Welcome, everybody, to a re-recording of a talk that I gave at the Science of Consciousness conference on April 18th, 2022. And I thought it would be good if I did it with a little bit more time and a little bit more detail and a few revisions. So here we go. Thank you for watching. This is called Introduction to Emergent Phenomenology, Global Ethical Impact. And I would like to thank everyone who helped make this video possible, of which there are many. I would also like to thank the good Dr. Larry Ward. Uh, we can create a society that doesn't suppress, deny, eliminate, or lock up. It's just a remarkable quote that I heard from him at a conference that I attended last fall. Very inspiring, great work. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being interested in the EPRC, Emergence Benefactors, Emergent Phenomena, and how we can make a global difference. Thanks to everyone who's contributed to this ancient and contemporary conversation, of which I will talk about a few of the countless people who have been part of this, um, but thanks to all of the unmentioned ones as well. First, a few definitions. Ontology. This is what you think is truly true. So if I say consciousness is primary, or materialism is primary, or that truly was divine love, or everything is emptiness, these are all ontological statements, and they're very interesting. We've been debating ontological statements for an extremely long time. They're also highly problematic, as essentially um, very, very few of them can truly be proven, though they may have some practical utility, and we'll talk about that. Epistemology is why you think you know something. So it's the evidential quality. Is this from a channeling that someone gave thousands of years ago? Is this from an old text? Is this from a modern contemporary prospective longitudinal trial? Is this from a case series or expert opinion based on a case series? Is this just an idea that came into your head? How is it that you know your ontological statements are true or not true? So epistemology deals with all of that. Soteriology is actually extremely important and not mentioned enough in these discussions, I think. Soteriology is basically how you think you will be saved. Often it applies specifically to Christianity or the Abrahamic traditions, but it applies also more broadly to the question of what's going to save you and from what threat. So doctrines of soteriology may even, uh, if you take this definition loosely enough, apply to what would save us from climate change or what would save us from nuclear war. What will save us from death is the common one or damnation is another one or the endless cycle of rebirths or whatever it is you think you need to be saved from. That's what soteriology is about. And then existential relates to questions of existence and being. So, do you exist? What does exist? How long do you exist? When did you begin to exist? What is this you, even, that might exist? What are these things that might exist? Questions of existence and being also figure very prominently into this whole discussion and are often not handled that well by the sciences. And usually, because they didn't handle them well, they sort of pick ideas of what does exist and what doesn't exist, despite even the fact that certain aspects of science or branches of science might totally contradict those things, and then go from there without having thoroughly questioned those kinds of assumptions, givens, or even ontological statements that they have made about existence without having a whole lot of proof for them. Perennialism we're going to talk about a lot. It's the notion that there is only one underlying fundamental truth of which all metaphysical traditions, esoteric and exoteric philosophies, religions, and sciences are a description. So in this, we're going to describe something of a rough perennialism. Uh, that is a clinical perennialism, that we have certain things in common, being humans or having experience, and we can talk about the utility of those sorts of ideas. There are also more strict formal perennialisms that get into philosophy and religious theory. We're not going to talk as much about those except sort of as a setup to things later on. And then I'm going to use the word emergent a lot. And it has a lot of possible meanings. It has specific meanings in chaos theory and specific meanings in physics and biology. And in this case, we're going to use it to mean what a lot of people would call spiritual, mystical, magical, energetic psychedelic, and some very specific existential, psychological, and perceptual effects. 
Um, you might call these high, the highs, lows, and weirds of emergent phenomena, uh, but that's what we're going to be using the word for today. Um, emergent phenomena, ex phenomenology examples. Um, the highs uh, commonly discussed, these are things that we might, some of the traditions might call things like jhanas or dhyanas, these meditative trances or specific states you can cultivate that are very blissful or peaceful or quantumous, formless, et cetera. Peak experiences widely described in a lot of traditions, um, specifically studied by Abraham Maslow, kundalini awakenings, manic episodes, uh, what the Theravada of Buddhism might call the arising and passing away, depending on how you want to lump or not lump these things together, very controversial. Pseudo-nirvana, psychosis uh, in some of its positive forms, conversion experiences, um, where people have been you know, touched by the spirit, seen the light, those kinds of things, uh, sometimes just, you know, described as a revelation. The general categories of highs include all of those. Uh, lows have been described in the various traditions as like being the dark night, knowledges of suffering. Again, whether or not you want to equate these or assume they're specific to their uh, particular traditions, long discussion, obviously a lot of controversy. Um, depersonalization, derealization effects, which some people really appreciate and some people very much don't, and why that is is complicated and still being studied. Um, psychosis, as it's generally labeled within uh, contemporary tr um, Western medicine, uh, depression, anxiety, chi, zen or shamanic sickness, etc. These are all variants of what we're calling emergent lows here. Weirds or things that are kind of mixed, people might interpret them differently. Some might be intentionally trying to cultivate them. Some might be actively trying to stop or eliminate them. But regardless, it's these experiences that sort of fall into this odd category, and that's going to be things like powers, psi, archetypal experiences, which might be positive, negative, or just strange, energetic experiences, existential shifts in perception, um, paradigm shifts, out-of-body experiences, NDEs. Uh, again, some variants of psychosis might just be strange, but might ne not necessarily fall into the categories of highs or lows. And then you've got these plateaus, which are sort of lasting places that people come to, this sort of sense of permanent, as permanent as things can be in this transient world, or awakenings, enlightenments, open vistas, divine marriage, ego death, the sort of lasting version, these, these places where people get to and there's something lasting and beneficial about them generally. Oh, there might be plateaus that are not as beneficial as well. Uh, lots of people over the years have attempted to categorize these. The first I'll mention is the VCE lab out of Brown, the good work of the uh, people such as Jared Lindahl, Willoughby Britton, the rest of their team. Um, they categorize these contemporary uh, in a contemporary context as relating to affective, cognitive, somatic, perceptual, the sense of self, cognitive, which is related to goals and motivation, and social effects. Um, the EPRC. Uh, has at the moment a looser and more broad and in some ways detailed categorization system, which again needs more scientific validation. Uh, it's very descriptive at this point, attempting to be relatively complete, but clearly not. Uh, and they would might describe these in the overlapping categories of sensate, perceptual, related to arousal, temporal effects, sequential effects, how things evolve over time, uh, spatial effects, dimensional, contextual, existential, psychological, emotional, volitional, archetypal, semantic, related to valence, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, the envelope, attack, sustain, and release of things, cognitive effects, psychological, paradigmatic, kinetic, vocational, uh, functional, behavioral, social, collective, cultural, expressive, uh, medical, energetic, magical, and meta-emergent effects. So neither of these conceptual systems are likely in their final form. Uh, all of them are going to need some validation. Revision might even vary depending on the task or application. But these are some of the ways that people are thinking about these at the moment. Some initial questions for those of you who are watching this. How many of you have had or know someone who has had a life-changing spiritual, mystical, magical, energetic, psychedelic, i.e. emergent experience? I'm guessing a reasonable number of you if you're watching this video. How many of you have known someone who might reasonably be reluctant to share such experiences with a boss, physician, or other mental health care provider? I'm guessing a reasonable number of you. If so, why? And what perhaps can we do about that? 
How many of you know someone who has had significant benefit, healing, beneficial transformation, or consciousness upgrade from emergent experiences or practices? I'm guessing some reasonable number of you, something to think about. How many of you know someone who has had some significant challenges or unwanted outcome in the short, medium, or long term from emergent experiences? I'm also guessing some reasonable number of you, if you think about it. And uh, raise your hand if you believe mainstream global medical and mental health care establishment has an acceptable, functional, loving, equitable appreciation of the uh, range of highs, lows, and weird emergent phenomena and effects. I personally don't. It's my current opinion, having worked in emergency medicine for 12 years and um, other exposure to the mental health world uh, through working at health hotlines and other things like that. I don't think at the moment that that understanding is there, uh, but we're going to talk about that and what we might be able to do about it. Um, so how many of you think that emergent practices, experiences, and our transformations will be part of our global health crisis or global general crisis solutions? Anybody? Maybe? Some of you? Hopefully? And how many of you think that these emergent solutions can scale globally and sufficiently with an ignorant and sometimes actively harmful global mainstream healthcare system? Yeah. So the relevance of this now, the practices that lead to emergent phenomena are scaling rapidly. Things like meditation, psychedelics, hot yoga, intensive prayer, and lots of other experiences and uh, forces that we think are likely to predispose people to these seem to be scaling globally. There's lots of polls and data on this. I don't need to present it all. Um, uh, but the mainstream clinical and public knowledge of emergent phenomena is simply not keeping up. I'm a you know, trained emergency medicine physician. I know how the system works. And I can tell you that its understanding of these things is totally insufficient for a nuanced appreciation of these. Um, and then the question is, how did we get here? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of how we arrived at this situation. Um, this is a very selective, incomplete, imbalanced history, which is designed to make a few key points. Obviously, the number of conversations, books, uh, players in this is so vast that in weeks of just talking continuously, I couldn't even mention them all, much into, much less go into depth about their fine work. But we're going to start with the axial age, which is where the data really becomes somewhat robust about this. And we'll, we'll continue on through today, and we will see what appear to be nearly the same conflicts and debates again and again. Uh, so there's not much new under the sun except the tools that we currently have to do way better than what happened in the first 3,000 plus years of this discussion. So the Axial Age, as most of you probably know, um, apparently nearly global explosion of philosoph uh, philosophy, emergent practices, writings, descriptions, and debates around these things. One example uh, that's re highly relevant to what we're talking about is the concept of uh, divine madness, um, which is an ancient uh, issue discussed in many ways by many Axial Age authors, including the likes of Plato and across many cultures. And it's this notion that, yes, these people might be crazy, but look at the amazing things that come out of them. <laughs> and sort of, you know, how we define divine and how we define madness here is obviously um, critical but let's just say this is a very, very old conversation. It's at least 2,800 years old, if not older. Um, and also lots of the debates that swirl around the ontological frames of this, um, various versions of materialism. We think this is a new concept that may have come in with the Age of Enlightenment and Newton and people like that, but it isn't actually. And the atomists and versions of materialism go back at least 2,800 years. Uh, similarly, realism, Gnosticism, the sense that one should know directly for oneself, uh, deep personal truths, transcendentalism, that this whole world can be transcended, dualism, the sense that there are truly separate things, monism, the sense that there truly aren't separate things, idealism, that this is all somehow created in the minds of people. It's obviously hardly doing the, the topic justice, that summary definition. Nihilism, that there's somehow nothing or there is no soul or variants of nihilism. 
um, solipsism that we have created this all in our minds or your minds or somebody's mind has created all this one person generally. Um, and the roots of perennialism and attempts at perennialism, at looking at how we might bring these disparate points of view together or looking at the common essential, essential truths or functional truths that might be um, common to a lot of the traditions or even all of the traditions, depending on how perennialist you want to be. Um, these rose in what we now call India and the countries around it, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, um, etc., Greece, uh, China, um, and plenty of, uh, of other regions all up and down the Silk Road, and likely lots of other places who record, whose records just didn't survive as well into this contemporary time. Um, there was a massive a uh, descriptive explosion of emergent phenomenology, of emergent practices, um, with some very clear descriptions of things like the risks, benefits, and alternatives, warnings, promises, options, things we could do, whole manuals of what people might attempt and why they might attempt them. This type of person might do this practice. This type of person might do that practice. Remedies for if things went well or didn't go well. Um, predisposing factors, the notion of what contributed to either good or bad outcomes, the concepts of grace, and karma, divine intervention, spirits, uh, demons, all kinds of ideas about these. Um, things related to the sense of, sense of uh, the chance of success or failure. Some might be blessed or cursed, again, with good karma, grace, whatever. Um, even families seem to have some talent for this. Um, tailored technologies that were very specifically designed for various types of individuals. In short, you know, 2,500 years ago, there were some very, very smart people with very sophisticated discussions of emergent phenomena um, that we have built on, extrapolated from, forgot, forgotten largely, uh, rediscovered, uh, iterated upon, et cetera, today. Um, the medieval period coming out from the Axial Age is ridiculously rich, uh, often a sort of a, a contemporary context. Some of this can get sort of superficially dismissed as being a period of darkness or, you know, the fall of the great empires or something. But in reality, the, the conversation around around emergent phenomena just got richer and richer. And if we consider, you know, um, institutions like um, Nalanda and some of the Catholic mystics and the, even plenty of aspects of the scholastic traditions, some of the more um, nuanced ones that were designed around qu questions of divine experience and all that, very, very rich period. Again, debates around Gnosticism, um, debates around uh, various schools of lots of other mystical traditions. Uh, it's extremely rich, um, politically sophisticated, practical. It was also very sectarian, very political. Lots of debates around ethics, lots of uh, economic debates and influences by various kings and famines and plagues and periods of prosperity. Long topic. The point is a lot of richness that we can draw on there, and we, I think we should draw on there. Um, and a lot of that literature is still available to us. And then... Um, sort of skipping that thing broadly and going into the Age of Enlightenment, um, as it's sometimes semi-ironically called, this is a fascinating shift uh, where culture seemed to rediscover a lot of things that it had sort of forgotten about, and particularly in a European context, thanks largely to Arabic uh, traders um, and who had preserved a lot of the classics, bringing them back in to the European context. Um, and uh, this is the age of alchemy, of mystics, of the Inquisition, of witch trials, which curiously enough still go on in a number of countries. This is the age of Galileo and his emphasis on measurement and what could be measured. This is a critical idea that brings back in this notion of only what is externally verifiable is real, only what is measurable is real. And this addition to the philosophical conversation, which again was not new, but the, the degree to which it became predominant in a lot of philosophical and scientific traditions is extremely important. And the opportunities that then, then presents us today to do something that simply could not be done for the first few thousand years of this debate and begin to actually measure in some uh, rudimentary way what seems to be going on in people's brains and bodies as these phenomena are unfolding is a remarkable opportunity um, that then is based on the ideas of Galileo, uh, but ironically, the ideas of Galileo 
um, really suppressed a lot of the first person methods for a very long time. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, who ironically was an alchemist, uh, very interested in deeper metaphysical issues, a mathematician, physicist, uh, out of him comes the notion of a clockwork universe and determinism, which is also not new. The notion of a clockwork universe and determinism in some ways also comes out of traditions such as Buddhism, which seem to argue for something of an absolute, if ultimately um, not fully comprehensible um, sense of causality of things just simply unfolding in an impersonal way. Again, old ideas reinforced by contemporary or uh, newer mathematical developments. Um, this also uh, began um, what would eventually become the, sort of the colonial period, which brought the sense of scientific materialism around the world. Um, if you haven't seen The Mad Woman's Ball, it's an absolutely fantastic movie looking at some of these things where they um, treated people with things like ice baths and opiates and isolation it was basically torture, um, an attempt to convince them not to be mad. Um, the Age of Enlightenment also brought us these fascinating poles of philosophy of very famous philosophers that had very, very diametrical yet extremely influential ideas on how the world is, how we should study it, how we should conceptualize and think about it, what even experience is. Uh, Rene Descartes being one of the more classic example, um, describes typical classic, basically textbook emergent openings that then launched his period of extremely deep philosophy from which we get both, um, car we get Cartesian dualism, this notion of the mind and body as sort of separate substances. We also get our Cartesian coordinate system that allowed all kinds of unfoldings in mathematics and geometry. Uh, remarkable person. And then in some ways, contemporary Contemporary with him was Thomas Hobbes, a very much a materialist, uh, in interested in a very objective science, the rule of law. And so we have these competing philosophers who are engaged in very similar bodies of uh, philosophical, naturalistic, and scientific study, and yet coming to extremely different conclusions, um, which, as you've noticed, there's an ongoing theme of sort of materialism, this stuff is not real, emergent phenomena are, you know, not a valid field of study, and those who inspired by them also created amazing things and became powerful uh, philosophers whose work still inspires us to this day. Um, as the Enlightenment and late modernity sort of progress, you get into one of my favorite philosophers, David Hume, a British empiricist, uh, sort of skeptical naturalism, uh, felt that experience was the primary basis of all other epistemologies and ontologies, that if you know something or think something in some ways, it had to have been based on your experience. It had to have been based on this moment. The notion of a past has to be based on this moment. The future has to be based on this moment. There's evidence he may have been influenced by Eastern philosophies. I would consider it, if it's a purely co-emergent or convergent evolutionary process, maybe, um, but uh, regardless, coming to very, very similar conclusions to lots of, uh, er, you know, meditators and uh, people who are practicing um, over 2,000 years uh, before him. Um, Hegel, uh, in this period, also really um, helps define phenomenology in a way that, at least in the Western traditions, it hadn't really been defined by before. It makes it much more of a field of study. Obviously, if you look at a lot of Eastern traditions and even the mystical traditions, their notion of describing first-person experiences you find again and again and again in their writings is something of a primary basis for why they were looking at things. And so Hegel really helped to sort of bring the this a foundational bridge that would help bring together first person, second person, and third person scientific methodologies in a way that they hadn't been quite before. Um, the same period was seeing a, a very powerful spread of sort of rich white capitalist and um, European American males basically telling the world what is okay, how to be, how not to be. Um, and backing that up with a global dominant mental health standards and practices, as well as armies and um, private mercenaries and uh, um, banking laws and all kinds of things that would um, very much sort of enforce something of a, a rational 
and redacted or cleaned up scientific version of lots of traditions, including Buddhism, um, uh, which if you read books such as the remarkable esoteric Buddhism by Kate Crosby argues quite strongly that before it was something much more of a full spectrum, diverse, radical, revolutionary, magical, mystical um, tradition. And there was this notion that it had to be either in order to keep up with the times or to survive colonialism or to prove its validity in this new political environment uh, had to be reformed. And you saw lots of reform movements in, in the 1800s in places like Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Burma, all of which had their similar in some ways, but unique in others reactions to uh, those sorts of colonial forces. Um, and then we get Karl Marx, um, in 1843, a uh, very strong critique of religion as the opiate of the masses. And yet, a lot of people don't know about him. He was a strong advocate for spiritual freedom and creativity. Uh, so a sort of first-person experience is being very important, actually, uh, which is not how this got translated <laughs> in some of the later variants of communism, which um, in their 1900s manifestations uh, tended to be very, very down on mystics and the like. Um, 1850s is when formal psi research really begins. Uh, research methodologies related to first-person experiences began to be refined as frauds were exposed and people began to, began to think about how can you attempt to validate these things in a way that was either more falsifiable or something. Um, and then... Uh, on what would seem like an unrelated field, but is actually a critical development. In 1853, John Snow and the cholera outbreak of London basically determined through a very thoughtful mapping of exactly where the cholera was happening, um, showed that it all focused around this one water pump, and he uh, removed the handle from the pump and the cholera outbreak um, uh, declined. And this was really the founding of this notion of modern epidemiology, that you could do population-based things in a more formal, essentially kind of mathematical or, or map-based way and get something meaningful out of it that impacted public health. And this was a thread that will later converge in the project that we now call uh, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium. Um, at this time, from a mental health and emergence point of view, for those wanting to sort of shut these things down, Basically, you had uh, potassium bromide, which was a sedative, anti-epileptic, anti-psychotic treatment. Um, it was considered sort of the standard of care at the time, in addition to the standard madhouse um, practices, which now we look at as generally relatively barbaric. Um, it'll be interesting to see how people look back on her own era in 100 years or two. Around that same time, 1875, you got the Theosophical Society founded. This is actually extremely important for those who don't appreciate the work that the Theosophical Society did while looking somewhat strange, sometimes dated, etc., to our um, contemporary point of view. Uh, still was extremely important in attempting a very thoughtful systematized, universalist, per perennialist way of looking at things with all these tables and correlations and correspondences of this tremendous amount of literature that was becoming available in the European context from Eastern sources and starting to be translated and people were attempting to synth synthesize some sort of collective grand philosophy and set of practices and understandings that it would incorporate all, all of the chakras and realms and energy systems and entities and colors and numerical systems and, and lots of other things into one grand thing that later became things like the Golden Dawn and, and eventually the New Age. It's nearly impossible to conceive of the New Age without actually thinking of how it came out of the work of the theosophists and related organizations and people motivi motivated and inspired by their work. Um, in that same time, you had other reform movements that were attempting something similar, such as uh, Jamgong Kontro uh, the Great, probably mispronounced that, and the Rimei non-sectarian movement in Tibet were attempting to get lin or, you know, bring together all of the lineages and look at what was essential um, to Buddhism and uh, Tantra, Mahayana, Vajrayana, those sorts of practices. Um, around that same period in 1883, you have Emil Kraepelin, 
His uh, compendium of psychiatry focused on sy symptomatology, classification, epidemiology, focused on treatment rather than incarceration, very much uh, beginning to get something of a biological malfunction theory of psychopathology, that this is something internally gone wrong, like a chemical point of view. So the notion of chemistry was um, being much better defined at this point. They didn't really understand what the chemistry was, but they were getting there. Um, similar period, uh, 1885, we have Sigmund Freud, who starts uh, founding psychoanalysis, um, was not really that much into emergent phenomena or religion with the singular exception of dreams, which he was super into. He thought the rest of it was relatively neurotic, but dreams, very important. It's interesting how people draw their lines of which emergent things they think are okay and not okay. Um, and that same late, teen, late 1800s period saw profound progress in statistical methods, which end up becoming very important for our work. Um, although these statistical methods, it is, methods unfortunately, were often um, uh, refined um, and promulgated by eugenicists as they were attempting uh, to justify their eugenics uh, work. Anyway, again, you see uh, this very complicated history of how we got here. Around 1900, uh, Husserl established phenomenology in a more formal way with logical investigations. Almost that, about that same period of time, um, real explosion of important uh, things right at the turn of the century, uh, 1901 to 1902, William James, a Harvard psychiatrist, um, gave his series of lectures, which became the Varieties of Religious Experience. It is unbelievably good if you have not read it or listened to it read it and listen to it. So often quoted, so often uh, referenced, so rarely appreciated in its full and unbelievable glory. It's a cautionary tale for us all because in some ways, at some basic level, it would seem that book kind of did so much of what 120 years later we are now attempting to do, and yet it didn't. It said and synthesized incredible things with incredible depths of sophistication around ontologies, epistemologies, merger of first, second, third person methods, etc. And yet its impact um, cannot be felt in any obvious way in any contemporary textbook of psychiatry or psychology so far as I can tell with a few not trivial, but um, very small exceptions, which we'll get to, uh, the fine work of doctors uh, Lukoff, Lou, and Turner. Um, so at around that same period, 1903, we have Carl Jung begins expanding psychoanalysis into a more, um, I'll say, emergent territory. He wouldn't have used that word, but with archetypes and dreams and the uses of madness, bringing back in this concept of sort of divine madness or useful madness or transformative madness that had been already been discussed for over 2,000 years. Um, but weirdly enough, his Red Book, which is an absolute masterwork of uh, emergent um, magic, mysticism, whatever you want to call it, philosophy, explorations, musings, etc., was not actually even published until after he died uh, due to his own fears. So you can tell, despite immense progress in the field, some of its founders were actually so afraid of the implications of their own work that they wouldn't even make them public. This is still clearly true today, um, so we have a long way to go. Um, in the shut it down side, we have in 1912, phenobarbital is the first powerful GABA agonist since alcohol that humans had access to. Um, also that same year, MDMA and the sort of open it up side of things uh, was synthesized and patented by Merck, though it wouldn't become popular until much later. In the 1920s, we saw um, logical positivism really come into a, a well-defined form that what can be measured is real and basically by extension what cannot be measured isn't real um, and it basically reinforced scientific materialism it took galileo and newton to their logical extremes in directions that probably galileo and newton themselves would not have been entirely comfortable with i'm guessing um, in 1929 remarkable discovery hans berger invents eeg 
And now with contemporary amplification technology and filtering and digital processing is now obviously at the part of the cutting edge of how we attempt to study these things. So um, in 1936, both lobotomies uh, were invented, cutting out the frontal lobes of people's brains to, to shut down uh, is violent or highly agitated or sometimes just troublesome or even just annoying uh, mental health patients. Um, was considered a revolution in its time, so very much on the shut it down side. Um, and 5-MeO DMT, uh, very much on the open it up side, was synthesized uh, that uh, year as well. Um, wouldn't come into mainstream use until much later. Um, so it gives us a sense also of the time scale of these things that we have to take into account for ho how long uh, change takes. The 1840s, uh, ECT or electroshock therapy. Um, became an important treatment for helping people with things like refractory depression, actually is still used today um, for refractory depression uh, 82 years later. Um, uh, around then, uh, April 19th, uh, 1943, Bicycle Day. Uh, this is when Albert Hoffman uh, accidentally ingests a relatively large amount, it seems, of LSD uh, that he had been playing with, uh, looking at ergot alkaloids. And um, 1947, uh, this becomes uh, commercially available as a Delicid uh, experiment started in the U.S. in 1949 and across the world. We don't usually think of this period as being revolutionary from a psychedelic point of view, but in terms of research, it actually was. Sort of, it's easy to think of the 50s and very, you know, the sort of leave it to beaverish sorts of terms. Um, but yeah, actually, a, a real flowering of the expansion of consciousness happening then. Um, and uh, the 1950s also, it was, there was an explosion of biostatistical methods, epidemiological methods, um, computer applications, and the ability to crunch numbers in a way that allowed taking large amounts of data and, and doing very fancy math on them or for the time that would allow you to compute uh, things like p-values from very large studies in a way that w was just vastly easier than w previously attempting to do that by hand. Not that p-values don't have their serious problems, but you understand what I mean. Um, around that same time in the shut it down side, it was uh, 1951, uh, Thorazine or Clopromazine was invented. Um, one of the most important antipsychotics. Uh, it was considered an absolute revolution. Um, and... Um, Around then, 1952, DSM-1, uh, it had actually come out of the army to attempting to get a sense of what was the mental health impact uh, in the war and how do we categorize this. And this is the U.S. Army. And how, how do we get some statistics on this then and see what is the impact of war on soldiers? And um, then that notion of sort of defined categories, which had come out of people like Krapelin, uh, then... Um, got solidified into the DSM-1, uh, which was out of the American uh, Psychiatric Association and was the first um, major global uh, clinical attempt at some um, more rigorous classification system, though others had existed before. Um, as I look at my old uh, textbooks of uh, psychiatry and nervous disorders, as they called them, um, from back in 1918, you still see some attempts at these. But this really solidified it in a way for the global clinical public that nothing else quite had before. It's coming from a very sort of biopsychosocial model and a psychodynamic in its approach with uh, strong influences by Meyer, who uh, was a stu student of Krapelin, and also some distinct Freudian influences. Most of these would go away in later versions, um, uh, pros and cons, perhaps. Um, uh, 1955, also uh, Librium, chlorodiazepoxide, uh, the first of the benzodiazepines was invented. So then there was an, an alternative to uh, the phenobarbital-based drugs. Um, uh, around the same time, the roots of Zen in the West uh, deepened through the beat poets, um, very much on the open it up side of things. Um, and then in the 1960s, Dr. Uh, Alexander Theodore uh, Sasha Shulgin begins experimenting with psychedelics, an extremely wide variety of uh, compounds and documenting their effects. Um, and this uh, 
begins to help open something of the doorway to a broader psychedelic movement and what would eventually become a more established counterculture. And um, at that same time, you have people like B.F. Skinner and the behavioralists and the, um, their notion of eliminative materialism, that all of this was pure conditioning, that there literally sort of almost no, was no will. This is all just unfolding psychological things. A stimulus leads to an effect. The effect leads to something else. We're all just causal, causal unfolded, unfolding beings that really maybe even psychological and inter internal phenomenal, phenomenology don't even exist, whatever that means, even if they seem to occur and be causal philosophically obviously quite complicated to think my internal phenomena don't exist, but whatever. These were some of the things that were going on at the time. Um, and sort of on the opposite extreme of that, we have transpersonal psychology, which is really sort of formally founded by the greats Abraham Maslow, who was studying peak experiences, Stanislav uh, Grof, with later work uh, by Christina Grof, uh, Viktor Frankl, and um, the establishment of Esalen in 1962. Uh, institute where transpersonal psychology and a lot of very important conversations and networking and ideas um, occurred. And, and then we start to get um, anti-psychiatry movements that were looking at what was happening in psychiatry and saying, no, we don't like this. We don't think this is valid. We don't think this is useful. These movements continue to today, pushing back against the medications or the sense of invalidating of experiences or saying this is all just crazy. Um, that's where we really find some of their roots. Uh, the psychedelic uh, era and researcher is exploding by this point. Uh, meditation is starting to take off in the Europe, Europe and the U.S. And, and even the same period uh, with traditions like Mahasi Saidao um, and many others in India across the Vedantic and Buddhist traditions and many others, we see this real resurgence of people getting into deep meditative practice, lots of lay people coming to practice um, in monasteries rather than just m monastics. It was a, a real uh, shift in, in how many people were actually doing what we will call emergent practices. And in 1969, I was born. So I uh, come into this conversation a few months before Woodstock, which needs no introduction or explanation. And then, as we see, rather than the open up side of things with Woodstock, we have the counter movement. Um, in 1971, Nixon's The War on Drugs, uh, which Ehrlichman later admitted was purely a political move to disenfranchise voters and shut down uh, groups like uh, blacks and hippies and to discriminate against people and to persecute them. Um, uh, the war on drugs uh, pushes psychedelics underground. Research drops dramatically, uh, goes to a trickle, almost nothing in comparison to the thousands of studies that had occurred in the previous two decades. And this illegality rapidly goes global, is enforced essentially by Western um, hegemony and, and uh, the residual effects of colonialism, uh, even though this is not formally a colonial period for much of the world, the impact was still obvious. And so you get the sort of virtual capitalist colonialism rather than the British, sorry, the previous sort of Victorian versions of colonialism. Um, 1970s, uh, we get the medical model of psychiatry starting to come in. This is dopamine and serotonin and GABA, this is a chemical imbalance in your brain, that medications are really what people need to be doing, not psychotherapy or psychoanalysis. This eventually led to the DSM-3 in 1980. Um, on the other side of this, you have the now, uh, by many people, nearly forgotten metapsychiatry and ultra-consciousness of people like Stanley Dean. Um, who extremely prominent psychiatrist, and there's a big movement around this, the notion of incorporating everything psi and, uh, you know, other what we will call emergent effects into uh, psychiatry, the notion that your consciousness could not just be healed and go back to a state that was free of depression or psychosis, but actually greatly enhanced into much more profound, expanded, 
um, healthy states of consciousness. Uh, Stanley, Stanley Dean's work and metapsychiatry and ultraconsciousness seem to almost entirely vanish around 1980. We're still re researching exactly what happened, but it's um, quite surprising that it, this thing that seemed to be so flourishing and there were large conferences just kind of disappeared. Um, around that same time, also in the 70s, 1973, we have IONS, Institute for Noetic Sciences, co-founded by Edgar Mitchell, who was an astronaut, and Paul and Temple. Um, he had a uh, very powerful, uh, mystical, or spiritual, etc. experience when he was coming down from space, as have at least four of the 500 or so people who have been in space, probably many others that just didn't report it for obvious taboo reasons. Um, and right around then, I actually start having my first meditative experiences, where as a young kid, I could get into these blissful and peaceful states just by breathing, an ability that I lost for another 20 years or so. I have no idea why. Um, around then, 1976, Dr. Shulgin was first introduced to MDMA, um, and it was first uh, used in therapy uh, by Leo Zeff around then as well. Um, so we start to see this other sort of opening up movements. Um, uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn founds MBSR, and the mindfulness industry begins. The notion was that you could take sort of a secularized version of mindfulness that initially was actually not described as being that secular. Initially, they're very comfortable, you know, relating it to Buddhism and talking about enlightenment and all those things. Um, tendencies that would become less predominant or at least public as it became more of a large established institution that was attempting to make clinical inroads into the mainstream and actually um, became quite successful at doing that through that sort of a strategy. 1979, the CCMD-1, uh, the Chinese version of the DSM, um, arises, very much influenced by it, actually looks quite similar. Um, and then uh, 1980, as I mentioned, the DSM-3 uh, is a radical departure from the DSM-1 and 2, uh, emphasizes uh, medications more um, significantly more neutral and sort of scientific in its approach to um, mental illness classification. So it thought of itself very specific formalized criteria and formalized diagnosis in comparison to what you found in the previous editions. At that same time, uh, the Spiritual Emergency Network is founded by the Groffs, so you get these weird parallels of the DSM, which basically says all emergent phenomena are either psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, bipolar disorder, um, uh, schizotypal, etc. None of this has healing or therapeutic value. It's all just bad. And basically at this time, the standard of care began, becomes it all needs meds. And then you have the spiritual emergency network founded by the Groffs where they're saying, hey, these are interesting phenomena that need to be studied in their own right, kind of with their own classification systems, borrowed a lot of classification systems in a very perennialist way from lots of different traditions, drawing on the work of the theosophists and being very comfortable with language, using language like Kundalini and stuff like that that came out of um, various specific traditions. 1984, I have my first Kundalini-ish experience. Um, I was trying to have better flying dreams, and by learning to visualize at around age 14 or 15, um, I have my first explosions of consciousness and travel out of my body for the first time. Uh, and then I got very lucky that I had the good sense to keep my mouth shut in that um, climate. Um, yeah, I should mention that my father, a delightful and remarkable person, was a Harvard, Yale, Yale, uh, Harvard trained pediatrician. And um, he admits free freely today that he would not have uh, known what to do or done something skillful or useful had I disclosed to him what was happening in my own consciousness at that time. And so I'm lucky that I uh, managed to escape unscathed from that system. I know plenty of people who weren't so lucky. Um, 1986, at a time when psychedelics are still very, very illegal in most places in the world, um, MAPS uh, was founded by Dr. Rick Doblin and others to promote psychedelic research. Uh, 1987, the first SSRI, uh, Prozac or fluoxetine, was developed um, to treat uh, depression, was also considered a revolution in its time. Fascinating books like Listening to Prozac come out. Uh, but the success, it seemed, of some of the now atypical antipsychotics and things like Prozac and benzodiazepines um, had a whole lot of increasing power and 
for, for the pharmaceutical industry to basically argue that the mental health standards of care need to largely be based on pharmaceuticals. They argued that psychoanalysis and psychotherapy were expensive. These, by comparison, were relatively affordable, thought to be more effective. And rather than endlessly sort of rehashing problems on a couch, you would just take a pill. It doesn't take nearly as long to prescribe. You walk out the door and hopefully you're okay. Better living through chemistry. Um, came into full mainstream swing in a way that it hadn't before. Um, uh, 1986, the Groffs publish the remarkable astronomy search for the self. Um, a few years later, a spiritual emergency edited by a bunch of different people. Um, these books ended up being highly influential on me about 10 years later and the things that came out of them. Uh, Similarly, Dr. Emma Bragdon, a source book for helping people in spiritual emergency, um, some of the great pioneers of this sort of contemporary synthesis, attempting to bring in a lot of different traditions, spiritism, New Age philosophies, Eastern and Western approaches into some kind of synthesis that would help people who were going through this territory in a way that was something other than your crazy need meds. Um, Dr. John Cabot Zinn publishes Full Catastrophe Living, a remarkable book that is, I think, somewhat more comfortable with the full range in some ways, at least as I read it, of the wide range of what can happen, not nearly as descriptive or particular as the Groffs, but still coming out of that um, same spirit of we need to apply some techniques other than just medications, introspection, noticing thoughts as thoughts, noticing feelings as feelings, and that these um, more internal or group techniques might have some validity again in a way that is beyond simply just meds. Very important work. Uh, at the same time, Dr. Emma Bragdon's The Call of Spiritual Emergency came out, also a really important book. Uh, 1993, Dr. Jack Cornfield's A Path with Heart, um, a book that was highly influential in my own life um, when I discovered it a few years later. Absolutely remarkable. Again, very um, interesting mix of perennialist and very specific. So the way it treats various maps of, say, the insight stages might apply just to insight traditions, but kundalini is, you know, ideas might apply to a lot of different traditions. It's one of these sort of transition books that that sits sort of curiously between something of a reverence for the, the Buddhist tradition in which John, Jack Cordenfield trained and also a great appreciation of the transpersonal um, perennial synthesis that were very comfortable with a lot of different models and frameworks. Uh, excellent work. Um, around that same time, you have Dr. Francisco uh, uh, Varela, um, Varela Garcia, I guess this is his formal name, uh, promoting and formalizing neurophenomenology, which was this notice that you, this idea that you could really merge first person and third person methods, which helped provide something of the conceptual and political validity uh, for studying emergent phenomena um, in a more um, formal way than had been possible before, and really pointing to the, the curious and new opportunities of our age in a world where there is not much new under the sun, but actually neuroimaging is, biostatistics is, and um, neurophenomenology in some ways then is a new thing which gives us new opportunities that the previous few thousand years of people in these kinds of dialogues simply didn't have. Um, 1991, the Mind and Life Institute was founded um, uh, 1993 and four, this is the period where the remarkable um, doctors Lukoff, Liu, and Turner managed to have what I think is the only success in penetrating the clinical mainstream that I can see um, continuing to this day, which is um, managing to get uh, the V6289 modifier code um, and other changes into what would then soon become the DSM-4 and what I call the spiritual exemption criteria, which is basically, this, uh, it's, it's a relatively small number of sentences, unfortunately, and a teeny fraction of what they wanted to get in, but they managed to breach the wall. And what they breached the wall with was this notion that if you were having experiences that in your tradition were considered okay, may be expected even, um, or a valid part of the spiritual journey, 
then if you're otherwise functional, perhaps those are not mental illness. Perhaps those are not, should not be classified as pathological and delusions or hallucinations, but in fact may have some sense of okayness about them. Something in the breach of the automatic, this is weird and crazy, needs meds. It has some issues, such as if you're having an experience that isn't well understood by the tradition you're in, or if you or the mental health person treating you don't know that those are a part of your tradition, as many people may not, you know, like they might be a Buddhist practitioner, for example, but not be well steeped in, you know, the Moody Maga, you know, or tantric phenomenology in the range of what might, might be expected at the deep end that they just suddenly found themselves in. Um, then they may not have sufficient access to the information they would need to apply this criteria, but it was still a huge step forward. And I actually think a, a large um, opportunity and opening that we have a lot of advantage to walk through and help augment uh, through good science the appreciation of the range of the territory and what can happen across traditions. Um, this has since been updated to the uh, Z uh, 65.8 code that you see in the ICD-10. The one uh, big, there's some big problems also I should mention. One is it's a modifier code. So a modifier code is not something you can actually bill for. So if you're lucky, you're lucky you get something like adjustment disorder with kind of spiritual problem. And it's also sort of phrased very much not in an emergent way. It's more like a crisis of faith or just sort of issues with your religion. It doesn't really have the phenomenological depth or range to to, to do what um, I know doctors uh, Lukoff, Lou, and Turner are willing to do. I'm thank, very thankful for Dr. Lukoff for the conversation I had with him um, as we were starting this whole project a few years ago when I was at IONS then. Um, in the 1990s, fMRI was developed by the remarkable doctors um, Ogawa and Kwong um, at uh, Martino's Imaging Center, uh, begins to be able to to take a look at blood flow and oxygenation as a proxy of brain function in real time or very close to real time. This is an absolute revolution in imaging. Um, 1994, right around that same time, I did my first nine-day intensive meditation retreat, the Insight Meditation Society, uh, thanks to uh, Christopher Titmus and Charter Rogel and Jose Rezig. Wow is all I can say. I had a whole bunch of extremely powerful experiences. I felt like I was catapulted out of my body. Things dissolved into vibrations, etc. Um, I was extremely impressed that, and and then with subsequent retreats that uh, these meditation techniques were able to reproducibly produce um, a bunch of the strange experiences I had as a kid and had no idea um, uh, what they were. Um, but then I started running into people who were like, oh, yeah, that's this, that's that. They had names for them. They could predict them. They could predict the sequence in which they would unfold. They had opportunities to cultivate the positive ones and techniques for mitigating the challenges and, and useful frameworks for handling some of the strange experiences and allowing more of a sense of normalization, empowerment than anything like I had before. Uh, the previous 10 years or so of wandering around in the dark, uh, nobody that I knew who had had them or had any idea what they were. Um, it was an absolute revelation for me, and I'm incredibly grateful for all the people I ran into as I was doing lots of retreats during that period who helped me. So thanks to all of you. Um, uh, 1997, I started talking with people about meditation experiences online. Uh, this is a remarkable time of early internet forums and chat rooms and things like that. And I started building up as by talking to people on retreats, my own personal, clearly, obviously biased case series of what other people were experiencing. And then I was pouring over a lot of books like the Vasudhimaga and the Vimudhimaga and Abhidhamma and other maps and models, again, A Path with Heart and books like that. These would eventually become um, the first edition of my own book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, which was um, talking very actively about the highs, lows, weirds, opportunities, challenges in a way that... Um, was following very much in that same spirit of people who had come before and were starting to be much more open about these things. Uh, this appears online for the first time in 1998. Um, Getting to the 2000s. In 2001, after um, two years of epidemiology school and then t and as a second year medical student, um, I read the DSM for the first time. Right? We're in my um, psychiatry class, and I'm looking at this thing going, uh, wait a second, 
that's all the stuff that me and my friends intentionally cultivate. And they have no option other than this is purely crazy. So validating my intuitive sense, don't talk with people about these things. Yep, there it was in black and white, and I was reading it going, wait a second, there's a serious problem here. And thus my dual life really began on the one hand. I was intentionally still going on retreats and doing a lot of practices designed to cultivate these experiences, which I considered the most beneficial, useful, sane, and helpful things I had ever done in my entire life, as did plenty of my fellow wanderers on the path despite the known challenges, which plenty of us also experienced. And on the other hand, I am learning to diagnose and treat these things as if they're purely pathological, and that's what I'm expected to do in the tradition of allopathic medicine, and presumably that is what people are coming to me, expecting to me, me to do. So, the, so begins this very, very strange period, which would exist... Um, yeah, for 17 years of being in these two worlds with no obvious way to really sort of put them together... Um, in 2003, on a very uh, intensive meditation retreat in Malaysia, um, I found what I personally was looking for as a result of meditation, um, found it was the sanest, most helpful thing that had ever happened to my brain. I still think that. Um, so unbelievable gratitude, sense of benefit, of possibility of these techniques, of the reproducibility, of the functionality, of the descriptions of all of them, just uh, unbelievable heart outpourings of thank you to everybody who figured this st stuff out and um, transmit it to us today. Um, and around that same time, um, 2005, Dr. Sarah Lazar puts meditators in an fMRI. It's the first time it had ever been done. Uh, one of the great pioneers in the field, um, showing structural and functional changes in emotional regulation, learning, perspective, taking, started and really started a revolution in meditation, spiritual neuroimaging. The world never looked at meditation the same way again. Uh, it's, it's impossible to overstate the impact this and subsequent studies had. Um, the notion that this was a measurable thing, it lent it a validity that it simply could not previously have had in a materialist, Galileo, um, mechanistic, biochemical-influenced universe. And suddenly you see the all of these things converging, the statistical techniques, the neuroimaging techniques, eventually you know, um, some of the sense of biochemistry of how this would work, finally coming together in the revolution that we're now experiencing and building on today. So again, thank you to everybody um, who is helping to build this and who built all the, the foundational blocks on which we currently expand. Um, in 2006, I finished my emergency, emergency medicine residency at the University of Louisville and go to work mostly in major one tra trauma centers, often with a high-end uh, psychiatric capabilities. We were the people getting people being sent to us as we had the inpatient psychiatric beds. We had the, the psych pod in the emergency department that I spent most of my time working in. Also in the pediatric emergency department, we get sent a lot of kids in crisis, which we're seeing a lot more of tragically. Um, around that same time, on the other side, the 2008, the Dharma Overground was co-founded by Vince Horn and myself as a massive online noisy case series related to emergence and all its glory, strangeness, horror, and occasionally death. Unfortunately, you get to see um, the struggles, the amazing transformations uh, writ large, um, and I... Uh, got to be exposed uh, both to how amazingly well this can go and how unbelievably badly this can go um, when people do or even sometimes don't crash into the mental health system, when they don't get things normalized, when they don't have the skills or the support they need or whatever other factors to have good outcomes as a result of these radical transformations of consciousness from meditation, from psychedelics, from intensive yoga, from prayer, from all kinds of other emergent practices. And so this begins to further um, spur my own impetus and a lot of our impetus and motivation to figure out how in the world can we do something better than what we've currently been doing. So we promote better outcomes for everyone who's coming up in this, better normalization, better criteria, better ways to cultivate the good, um, better ways uh, to avoid or mitigate the challenging things and how to deal with the weirds in a way that that works well across a variety of cultures and countries and systems. Um, 2011, I was invited to review uh, a journal article by the remarkable Dr. Andrea Grabovac by the journal Mindfulness. It was on insight stages and clinical practice. And um, 
it was one of the first times this someone had attempted to really formally describe the stages of insight. Um, there were some articles a long time ago about this by people like Brown and Englert um, that really didn't gain any clinical traction and they're sort of more scientific or philosophical or how they might apply to a specific tradition. But this is attempting to bridge the the sense of maybe there is something universal or perennialist about what is described by the Theravada tradition as insight stages, and this might be something people actually see in clinical practice. Again, a controversial idea. That same year, Drs. Willoughby Britton and Judd Brewer invite me to, me to Cheetah House for my first fMRI study of the PCC and meditation at Brown and Yale. Very exciting times. Thank you to uh, both of these teams and to Cheetah House and the VCE team. Um, this is the first time I really could see for myself, wait a second, when I do something with my brain, eight seconds later, I can see it reflected in this uh, bar going up or down into the blue or into the red. Oh my gosh, they can actually see some of this stuff. It was paradigm changing for me. So incredible gratitude to them and the work they did then continue to do. Um, 2013 and 14, I get to participate in uh, EEG studies doing, using beamforming technology of the PCC at Judd's lab at Yale and then later, later at UMass in the Center for Mindfulness. And again, I get to see, wow, rather than a million plus dollar toy, many million dollar toy, uh, you know, at $1,000 an hour, and now they've got, uh, you know, an eight thousand, sorry, an $80,000 toy, you know, at $100 an hour or something, and they can do something that looks very similar. It's just quicker and perhaps slightly noisier, but definitely seemed eventually they tweak their algorithm, so it really seemed to respond like the fMRI did. So again, watching these incredibly fast scalings of the technology to something, you know, much closer to consumer grade, unbelievably cool to watch and to see this work. Uh, so this is uh, an image where Dr. Uh, Judd Brewer and his team allowed me to do a meditation run. And what you're seeing, the first mark is me dropping in to what I would think of as the arising and passing away. The second red mark, um, you can see that it really drops down a lot. This is where I go down to dissolution. Um, for the next few marks, um, until the one, two, three, four, five, six one, I'm in what I would think of as knowledges of suffering territory, uh, where you can see the PCC, the, the lines are going down. This is more PCC activation, up is deactivation, according to this uh, measurement scheme in the EEG. And then I shift into uh, equanimity, and you can see a long period where it's much more up. Some of those big down lines are actually eye blinks, just sort of twitching of facial, facial muscles. And then there's this little down period, and then I get to what I think of as fruitions. And then you can see the PCC is way deactivated in a way that it just wasn't quite for anything else previous to that. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, maybe we can see individual insight stages with algorithms like this and you know looking at other brain centers as well perhaps we can even figure out how to measure and validate these things not only in me but in other meditators again revolutionary technology that i found incredibly inspiring and really shifted the entire way i looked at the potential to bring all of these things together um, obviously, I'm not the only one to have done that. Um, There's a lot happening at the time of people trying to figure this out. And it's not like people hadn't put EEG on meditators before, but some of these more sophisticated algorithms to image deeper structures are, are new innovations that are just changing the world and what we can do with much more affordable and available technologies. Around that same time, um, we see a lot of market forces. And speaking of commercial products, this is just a quote I'm going to read from Market Watch, uh, June 5th. 2013, um, with the bolding being mine for those looking at this on video. Uh, quote, the changes to the DSM-5, the updated manual of psychiatric illness released earlier this month, include 15 new mental disorders. Psychiatrists and consumer advocates hope that the new range of diagnoses will help more people to find treatments for their suffering. But... Drug companies could also see a benefit. It is likely that the changes will expand the demand for prescription medications that could treat these conditions. The 2010s, some key publications. Um, 2017, the Varieties of Contemplative Experience, or VCE Lab, uh, published uh, the Varieties of Contemplative Experience, a mixed method study of meditation-related challenges in Western Buddhists by Lindahl et al., a series uh, which has continued to produce publications. I think they have five, they say, coming out this year. I, I was just emailing back and forth with Jared about this. I was a part of these studies, incredibly important work. Um, 
and so thankful for them for bringing forward the possibility that meditation might lead something to just sort of calming down and seeing your feelings as feelings and getting some space around them, that there might be more to this in terms of highs, lows, and weirds. They're focused primarily on some of the strange or more challenging or destabilizing experiences, understandably, because it's a neglected area of research. Similarly, in 2017, uh, we see Mind the Hype, uh, a a critical evaluation perspective agenda for research on mindfulness and meditation by Van Dam et al. It's a fantastic paper that very thoughtfully takes a look at whether or not meditation actually does all the things that they say it does and what the evidence and or lack thereof is and what else needs to be studied. Extremely important. Um, the next year, uh, 2018, The Dark Side of the Dhamma, why we have adverse Sorry, why have adverse effects of meditation been ignored in contemporary Western secular contexts? This is by Anna Lukaitis, their master's thesis later published as a book. Um, extremely important looking at these other sides of the thing that this is more than just, oh, mindfulness helps us calm down and relate to our feelings skillfully, and that's all it does. It has no side effects. Um, 2018, Future Directions in Meditation Research, a critical paper by Veeton, uh, Recommendations for Expanding the Field of Contemplative Science, Veeton et al., highly recommended uh, reading. And then 2019, also a brilliant book, um, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experiences in the 70s by Eric Davis. Um, again, looking at ontological, epistemological, and critical issues Yes, it says it's about the 70s, but it's really very much as much about today and how we got here and the history. And if you haven't read it and you're a younger person who didn't live it, I highly recommend reading all of these papers and that book will help catch you up on how we got here. Um, Jared Lindahl wanted me to add some quotes to this talk. So these are direct quotes from an email from him coming out of the Varieties of Contemplative Experience Project out of Brown. I'm just going to read them straight as he wrote them. The VCE study is the largest qualitative study, N equals 100 plus to date, on emergent phenomena in the context of Buddhist meditation or any meditation tradition as far as I'm aware. Again, this is my now inserting something, again, perennialist attitude. It establishes a typology of large, though not exhaustive, range of experiences greater than 60 types across domains that can be challenging or adverse. It investigates the causes that lead to those phenomena and that influence their trajectory. It shows how pr practitioners and teachers differentiate experiences that are normative and expected in their specific meditation culture from those that are concerning or warranting intervention. It documents the strategies employed by practitioners and teachers for uh, managing or mitigating challenges when necessary. And finally, it shows how the question of how to interpret or appraise emergent phenomena is context dependent and argues that appraisals of and responses to them will be most ethical when informed by the person-centered approaches developed in cultural psychology or psychiatry on this last point, we represent something of a departure from the spiritual emergency paradigm developed in the era of the Grafs. And so we see in the VCE an evolving iteration based on previous work, some notions of this rough clinical perennialism that I'm talking about, with a sense that maybe these things apply in lots of different contexts, um, the notion that uh, these things must be um, interpreted in specific contexts, again, coming out of Lukoff, Lew, and Turner, and everybody who really thought about the question uh, before in a lot of ways that wasn't a strict and absolute perennialist. Um, and uh, thinking about pragmatic outcomes, this is obviously based on something of a biased case series, obviously of experts that they had access to, a remarkable series. Um, doesn't involve prospective clinical trials of any of these theories, but is really the foundation of how you build the, those kinds of things. You start with case series, and then you build them into expert opinion based on case series, and then hopefully eventually we'll have prospective clinical trials based on these ideas, comparative diagnostic management cultivation and conceptualization frameworks, etc. That is what we are hoping to do um, with others in the space, such as the VCE group, uh, and as the EPRC, that is, uh, um, yeah, this is part of the larger project that we are hoping to work on. 
Origins of the EPRC, so the Emergent Phenomenology Research uh, Consortium, in 2018. I happily retired from clinical emergency medicine and then had the resources to dedicate to other projects. After wandering a bit and getting a sense of the lay of land outside of emergency medicine, which had been taking up uh, uh, 70 plus hours of my time per week uh, for the previous long while, um, I ended up getting uh, invited in the summer of 2019 uh, by Dr. Julieta Galante, an MD-PhD in the Department of Psychiatry at Cambridge University, to start working on thinking about how in the world we can bring some science, uh, emergence, clinical practice, and these together in a better way than what had happened before, to understand what had already been done, what needs to be done next, and how we can actually make some of that happen. In the fall of uh, 2019, a larger group starts gathering around this of people thinking, hey, wait a second, um, we have you know, all these doctoral degrees and master's degrees and clinical expertise and neuroimaging capability and biostatistical methods and, and all kinds of other disciplines that are all starting to gathering, gathering around the idea of doing something better. Maybe we could be the change that we want to see in the world and have that happen globally. And this um, started to galvanize, um, particularly as that summer, and even now, if you look at the mainstream uh, textbooks, they're really no better when it comes to the stuff than they were decades ago. When I first trained in these ideas, Rosen's and Tintinelli's textbooks of emergency medicine, I've met them both, remarkable people, um, but uh, they have almost nothing that I would actually consider useful or sophisticated or based on good data or good comparative studies when it comes to emergent phenomena. Unfortunately, um, the big book of emergency uh, department psychiatry, um, the board certification exams, the criteria out of the WHO, ICD-10 and now 11, um, the, the DSM-5, CCMD-3, the Latin American variants, GLADP, etc., have almost nothing on this stuff. One of the only exceptions, curiously enough, is the Chinese CCMD-3, which has um, attack by witchcraft and qi sickness, curiously enough. So moving in uh, what I would think was a more expansive direction in comparison to the DSM. Uh, there are no data-driven protocols or management strategies found in any of the mainstream sources that I've been able to find related to these things. You find it exclusively in the alternative and transpersonal literature. And so the, the clinical mainstream, medical education, uh, mental health mainstream, as far as I can tell, still has largely nothing when it comes to these things. And so there is ample expansion possibility and opportunity for enhancing and upgrading their understandings to something much more sophisticated and built on the work that had come before. So the EPRC, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, was founded in early 2020, now over 100 global members from some of the most impressive universities in the world. In fact, most of the most impressive universities and plenty of other excellent uh, universities as well, as well as people who are not involved with the universities, um, our private citizens, uh, private people in business, um, et cetera, philanthropists. Uh, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, it's an experiment in what I will call synthesis. So if you have thesis, which is that all of these phenomena are bad, need to be shut down, have no therapeutic value, or simply strange um, to be medicated away. And then you have antithesis, which is, no, these are transformational, can be related to non-medicinal uh, or you know pharmaceutical-related ways, um, often uh, may be looked at through lots of different frameworks, may be valid spiritual experiences, whatever that means, um, may be really important, transformational, et cetera, should all be normalized, accepted, whatever. Um, then you have the synthesis, which is what we are attempting. Again, not alone in this world, plenty of other groups working on similar attempts at syntheses. Our attempt at synthesis is grounded in ethics. We'll talk a lot about that. It's clinically focused, so we care a lot about outcomes and what actually adds value to care and helps people or helps practitioners or people undergoing these experiences. Different from many previous approaches, is ontologically agnostic, have no particular interest or even seeing much validity at this point or, or utility in um, coming down on the side of either materialist primary or consciousness primary uh, it's hard to find a clinical application for those most of the time. 
um, uh, and leaving it wide open so that people can add their own ontological overlays as they will anyway, as every clinician and scientist knows, or politician or public policy person. Um, linguistically, very descriptive, um, globally scalable. So thinking about what kind of recommendations, linguistics, ontological frames or lack thereof will actually scale globally and be as applicable in Tehran or Shanghai or, or Johannesburg, Rio de Janeiro, Cairo, rural Alabama, where I currently sit talking to you, California, um, et cetera, um, you know, the outback of Australia. What just adds value and works in plenty of these contexts that people will appreciate and go, ah, yes, thank you. That was helpful. Non-aligned, meaning we're not coming into this from any particular tradition, plenty of previous groups um, have studied the meditation effects of their particular traditions. Very interesting um, literature coming out of uh, the TM tradition, for example, transcendental meditation or Tibetan uh, Buddhism, for example. We're not coming at this from any particular alignment. Results neutral, so we're not trying to say these things are great or these things are terrible. We have no incentives to be pro or con. Our incentive structure um, is very much to just be a straight purveyor of information um, that is uh, both good, bad, pro, con, can be interpreted in different contexts, and to be open about that, to be systematic in our approach as well. So to be thinking very structurally about what needs to occur, how do you build this field, what evidence is there, what is missing, and to have more of a sense of a global coordination around that as a result of lots of conversations with people in the field and addressing the needs of people actually out there and what they need. Um, it's functional, so we care a lot more about outcomes and what works. Uh, um, data-driven, meaning we want high-quality data, which obviously is very expensive and takes a lot of time to accumulate properly, um, but data-driven in a way that some of the previous biased case series or committee opinion or expert opinions weren't in quite the same way, though may all be very valid within their scope and valuable, perhaps, in certain contexts. Um, synergistic, meaning we're trying to figure out the natural win-win-wins that make sense economically, clinically, uh, legally, linguistically, culturally, and trying to find the, the overlap of where all those come together in a synergistic way. Uh, it's comprehensive, so we're, we're trying to build a, a full, robust science of this. It's long-term. We think, based on basically every previous development, that this will take at least decades to be fully integrated um, or largely integrated into global healthcare systems, given how long these changes take. It will also need to be sustained for decades in a way that previous movements, usually based on single individuals or not thinking long enough or underestimating how long it would take um, to change these things or underestimating the inertia of these systems. So we think that this project will need to be well-funded, well-sustained by hundreds of people for decades to likely have meaningful impact. Phenomenological. So very much um, taking into account people's first-person experiences, um, as well as other outcome measures, um, and physiologically perennialist. This is this rough perennialism I've been talking about, meaning that, for example, if you see a bright white light, regardless of what tradition you're coming from or your conceptual or ontological or religious overlay, there's very, very few pathways and maybe even one by which that can occur in the brain. Um, that there is, at, at, in some loose way, um, some sense of commonality, obviously, with some genetic, genetic and physiological and both nurture and nature variants, but that, that some variant of the clinical perennialist perspective that appendicitis is appendicitis, yes, it may present in a number of different ways and be in different locations and have some anatomical variants, but you can still say there's a thing called appendicitis and have that make sense regardless of where you are in the world or what religion or spiritual tradition you happen to be. Um, this is very grounded in medical ethics, as we said earlier. So we're going to take those criteria and kind of take them apart generally. So autonomy, the right, right to determine your own health care and or practice, aka respect for people and their general rights to have informed consent, that you should have high-quality 
data about the risks, benefits, and alternatives about diagnostic strategies, which at the moment are just sort of generally rigidly imposed, usually by a committee that's not somewhere, um, of treatment strategies, usually not that well backed up by good outcome studies and data at the moment, unfortunately, as much as we would like them. Cultivation strategies for the positive things and what might be the the risk benefits and alternatives of various ways you might do practices of doses of um, specific techniques, et cetera. Um, and this is all basically about basic human rights. Um, these require high quality outcomes related data, which we currently don't have, um, and we need them. Um, particularly in comparison across traditions, essentially almost none of that has been done. It's based on justice. So the question of what is distributed and distributable around the world in terms of benefits and burdens. How can we figure out what um, allows the linguistics of this to scale globally, the conceptual frameworks underlying it to scale globally, and what will people universally agree on? Ah, that was useful. Thank you. That helped us do better, feel better about what we're doing, be more okay. Um, that's our big question. Obviously, it is a, is a tough question and a tall ask. Beneficence, how do you have enough information to do good for the patient and or a practitioner? This typically requires, again, very useful knowledge, uh, high quality data, aka some sort of sense of truth, obviously a complicated a discussion in our highly divided, um, seemingly post-truth times. Um, so it's what adds value to care, aka what is based in a sense of love for other individuals, our fellow humans. Um, uh, what helps reduce suffering? Also, non-malfeasance, making sure you are not harming patients or practitioners or whole societies or cultures um, by not uh, imposing on them things that then cause suffering. Um, this thing, we think this is also a civil rights issue. How do we have a reduction in taboos or an elimination of taboos that allows honest conversations about these when they happen to people so people feel safe, that they can come out of their emergent closets? Um, that they are not forced uh, into situations of hospitalization and medication when um, good science can hopefully demonstrate that there were other valid options for adding value to care, that uh, people are not needlessly put in uh, custodial relationships or have job loss or be you know, declared to be broken for life by some quote-unquote lifetime condition. I have plenty of friends that were told something like that that later on had no signs of the bipolar disorder or the schizotypal or the schizophrenia or whatever that they were diagnosed with, none at all, in fact, were enhanced and more functional than they previously were. So I know for certain that there are some serious flaws in the system uh, that can be hopefully corrected by high quality data. However, we have to be very attentive to mainstream clinical needs. Having been in the mainstream clinical world, I understand these well. Mainstream clinical needs involving the need to be thought respectable by scientists, governments, institutions, peers, and the public. I think that with high quality data, we can add to their respectability. Um, Safety and freedom from bad out outcomes, such as lawsuits or job loss, if something goes wrong, we need to provide high quality uh, data and perhaps even thoughtful reform of systems that helps people uh, make decisions and not be needlessly penalized um, if and when things go wrong. Uh, sense of meeting their epistemological needs of the clinical mainstream, underlying physiology, so that we have a, a lack of uncertainty. We need neuroimaging, biochemistry, genetics, and epigenetics around what in the world is going on to the degree that we can measure those for these kinds of phenomena. Again, high-quality evidence and outcome-based studies, these are time-consuming, they're expensive, they need to be replicated and then replicated again. Uh, the replication crisis in mental health is um, now extremely well known. To be able to have the resources to do enough studies to have a sense, yes, we can rely on these findings, and yes, we have a sense of the nuance of what is going on. We need to help them manage their own ontological crises, right? So a lot of people have been brought up in very materialist paradigms. So we need a good synthesis. We need good neuroimaging. We need things that help bring together these worlds of thesis and antithesis in some kind of way that they can both go, yes, okay, that moves things forward. That was of benefit. Thank you. 
We need quality metrics. A lot of the you know, studies of meditation have not been based on the kind of quality metrics that actually gets you incorporated in the clinical mainstream that the MBAs care about, right? Patient satisfaction, quality adjusted life years, service utilization rates. We need to take into account the lobbying groups, the pharmaceutical industry. Why are they there? What do they need? What is their point of view? And where are they coming from to figure out win-win wins? Um, these are very, very powerful groups and need to be taken into account by any pragmatist, real politic person who's attempting to figure out how to do something useful in this multiplayer world. Cost reduction. How do you reduce ER bedtimes, inpatient bedtimes, medication costs in basically every country except those with um, complicated incentives to increase medication costs, a very, very complicated topic. Healthcare system costs. Um, how do you uh, get at people's own fear of madness and death? Um, you know, if you've been in the clinical world and you've seen someone who is objectively having a terrible time and freaking out and you've given some powerful medication and they are then not having a terrible time and not freaking out, that is very reinforcing if you've done things that clearly have saved people from death uh, by their own hands, for example. You know, if you have a fear of madness and death, which understandably people do, um, then working in these systems can be very, very validating of your actions as you see immediately you've saved someone's life, you have helped them not be so um, dysphorically crazy. We need to have a very thoughtful conversation about the validity of those things and an ability to upgrade those that looks at also medium and longer term outcomes uh, and also thinks about the risks of doing something other than what we currently do. Um, again, th there's, these are going to be bold studies that are going to be complicated and need a very nuanced conversation around to meet the needs of the clinical mainstream. This has currently not been done at all so far as I can tell and again will help bridge these worlds in a thoughtful way. We also need to what's to talk about what is return to function. This is a really challenging topic because for some people, returning to function is going back to their, you know, their corporate cubicle and being a highly functional worker bee. When a lot of these emergent practices are well known to potentially incline people to monasticism sometimes, to uh, renunciation to having a different relationship to consumerism and capitalism. The notion of mindfulness is just something that helps, you know, people have lower health insurance costs and, and less depression, and anxiety, and making people more productive is something that is now currently being questioned. And we need very thoughtful outcome studies, both in the short, medium, and also long terms, to look at what do emergent practices lead to, what do emergent effects lead to, and how do we know that? And then, you know, what is the role of these things in relationship to various uh, consumerist or capitalist or renunciate structures? We need to talk about maps versus no maps. This is a really controversial subject. You, cl clinicians intrinsically need criteria to make diagnosis. They're going to exist in a world where even if it's just something of functional, they need to be able to say, this is dysfunction, this is function, this is health, this is non-health, this is wellness, this is more wellness or less wellness. As a functioning clinician, you're going to need to put something on a form. That's just the way the system is. That's the way it's going to be. It raises larger questions of, do we have people who are non-experiences of emergent phenomena have the capacity through algorithms to diagnose and treat emergent phenomena in a skillful way? I would say as someone who's never had a migraine, that I could look at someone seeing weird wiggly lines and having odd perceptual alterations and things, that even never having had one, I felt I got pretty good at diagnosing, thinking of a differential diagnosis for what else could this be, and then treating people who had migraines. And I got better and better and better at that, even though I've never had one. So I have ample evidence that strange things that we haven't had, we can still learn to relate skillfully to as thoughtful clinicians and practitioners and people in the world who are trying to make a positive difference from outcomes. But we still need good data on whether or not that is true and validating this in clinical trials, because I have plenty of friends in the emergent space who 
somewhat dismissively or perhaps realistically, we, we need good data on to see, um, say, I don't know, maybe we really need experiencers treating this, these experiences. And so this is something that also needs to be tested in prospective clinical trials and validated to see to what great degree each of these sides is making a useful point. We need to incorporate this into textbooks and protocols, and to do that, there is no way not to have maps. But it is also true that as soon as you introduce a map to somebody, you risk artificial categorization, comparison, competition, again, pathologizing things that are not well understood, which is what I claim is currently happening as a result of the current maps we have in the clinical mainstream coming out of the DSM-5. I'm obviously not the first person to have said this, um, plenty of smart psychiatrists have a similar point of view. And then figuring out how we can have an ongoing conversation about dealing with whatever problems we create from a Larwellian point of view. You know, if you draw a line between a this and a that, you've created a problem that you then need philosophy or in this case, cri clinical criteria and outcome studies to solve. And that same kind of way, we need to very, be very thoughtful about any time we draw a line to question, okay, what have we done that is good? And what have we done that might cause some problems in certain patient populations or from certain points of view? And have that being ongoing conversation rather than just, okay, this is how it is. Have a nice day. Speaking of alternative resources, there are a lot of problems with all current, current alternative resources that, that have looked at the thesis of clinical mainstream practice and gone, oh, wait a second. A lot of them are extremely under-resourced sometimes biased towards a specific tradition, not always having the ontologically, ontological or tradition-related or linguistic neutrality that we feel will scale in the world and that is required to scale and meet the criteria of medical ethics of global justice and equity, often not reimbursed by national health systems and insurance, and these people understandably need to eat as they try to help people. There are severe linguistic and cultural limits of calls, calling things kundalini, for example, that obviously doesn't scale um, in plenty of parts in the world, there might be perfectly useful language that we need to acknowledge might have some validity in certain contexts or, or add some value to care regardless of notions of absolute validity. Um, there's tremendously variable oversight, training, and quality of the degree to which people who are offering alternative care, to the degree to which they themselves have experience with this, to the degree to which they themselves are lending to positive outcomes or desired outcomes in the people that they're reaching. Obviously, because these things are not global, they're not so equitable. Um, obviously, you know, these days, if you can afford to run into, you know, the usually expensive alternative transpersonal practitioners and shamans and meditation teachers or, you know, clergy or whatever it is that um, whatever people have some kind of expertise for what you're going through, obviously tons of people in the world don't. So we have, are not meeting anything like the, the basic ethical criteria of ju justice and equity. We have no high-quality comparative data-driven methods that are validated in comparative clinical trials, as you would hope in evidence-based medicine, um, or even just people trying to make good decisions about what they should do and how they should do it. And in short, for this to scale, the mainstream healthcare system has got to be better empowered. They're currently not. Um, and also, you need the infrastructure for all the people like I'm going to use what I call the Tesla model. So Teslas need good roads. They need good emergency departments for when things go wrong, which inevitably happen for any motor vehicle. They need good stoplights. They need good traffic laws. They need people who are um, enforcing those traffic laws. They need uh, people who are building all of the components, making good high quality paint for the roads that doesn't you know, just break down when it's driven over a lot, you know, and good reflectors and, and, and the signs and all of these things. In the same way, the brain hacking industry, the people who are trying to upgrade consciousness or do you know, consciousness 2.0, they've got to have the infrastructure for when these things go strained or sideways or they push people into territory that they may not have been expecting. And the clinical mainstream may have antiquated or what I think and plenty of people think is inadequate models uh, for describing and then diagnosing and then managing and or cultivating things that are going on. Um, ontological agnosticism also basically hasn't been tried really, kind of, sort of. In theory, the clinical world is, tries to be descriptive and neutral, but in practice, it is beholden to a relatively rigid and oppressive, I find, and plenty of people find, scientific materialism, which alienates people from their care. So in some ways, the clinical pragmatism is both problematic and also extremely um, 
empowering as a possible solution that just looks at what's value adds value to care. Good clinicians lay very, very little soteriological and ontological overlay on their patients and allow them as much as they think is reasonably functionally possible. And obviously, where to draw that line is complicated in terms of do they say this was Christ consciousness? Do they say this was a dark night? Or do they say this was a naf or being touched by the spirit or some energetic kundalini thing? Or however they describe this, some other opening described in their own traditions they're coming from. And yet a good clinician works with that to add value to care. We're trying to figure out how to scale more of that and build it functionally into these systems, realizing that there's lots of problems that can come from that and going in eyes open of all the downsides of what happens when you come up with a fixed system. So again, this clinical focus thing, we've already talked about migraines. When I see, you know, or when a patient says to me, doctor, I'm seeing these wiggly white lines and the right side of my head hurts and I'm nauseous and wanted to lay in the dark for two days and sound bothers my ears. I never asked the question, are those wiggly lines real or not real? Uh, I never asked their ontological status. Instead, I looked at them through a functional lens like, oh, wiggly white lines. You've seen those before? Yeah, I see them every time I get a migraine. You had a CT scan and MRI? Oh yeah, I've had those before. This is now just the same wiggly white lines. Great. Then they help me just do something clinically useful and their ontological status of whether or not they're real or not real or consciousness primary or not never comes into the equation. And I can just think, oh, okay, likely just reinforcing thing that helps me understand this is a migraine. I can now do something useful. We think that also applies to beneficial transformations to just the strange ones that aren't obviously painful or pathological like migraines are and can allow us to just think about these things in a way that's like, oh, here's some clinical skill. And we can bring that sense of clinical skill to things. That's what we're hoping to give good data to support. And if we look at other things that are first-person based, you know, imagine if we said, people with sickle cell disease, you just have sickle cell delusional disorder. And because we can't manage your pain, this isn't real. That would obviously just be cruel and horrible. And yet that kind of stuff happens with emergent phenomena all the time. It's not real. It's not valid. You couldn't possibly be having those. And this is dismissing, you know, people I know who are MDs and PhDs and MD PhDs and at top universities, you know, the theory a very respectable individual. But if they told you this, all of a sudden, a lot of people would go, I don't know about them. Hmm, that's very concerning. You know, when, when suddenly you're through a sense of training and cultural conditioning and the re residual impact of how scientific materialism then got overlaid into di you know, diagnostic criteria for psychosis and things, which were only really invented in the last, you know, in terms of diagnosis, 130, 40 years or so. Um, or, or think about things like Lyme disease, which can present in all these weird ways, right? And yet you can go, oh, maybe that's Lyme disease. So we know that clinicians who have never had experience with Lyme disease can yet do pattern recognition for very, very complex conditions, you know, positive ones we hope as well, um, or panic attacks, right? So like there are all these ways to deal with panic attacks that don't have anything to do with medication and may just be mindfulness techniques that can help people to ground down or to stabilize environmental factors of soothing music or, or a peaceful environment. There are all these techniques that we know can help things that are diagnosed in the clinical mainstream and yet can have a positive impact of helping people. Or multiple sclerosis, another one, pr present all these strange ways and you can go, wow, I wonder if that isn't MS. And then some, send someone to an expert, for example, a neurologist, who's really good at diagnosing that. I think Think we need to have similarly trained experts for the wide range of emergent phenomena um, that we can send people to. And obviously, I'm not alone in thinking that um, this has been proposed before. So uh, linguistically, globally scalable, also the language that people use for this. So in order to scale globally, we've got to choose really neutral language. We have to choose very descriptive language. Um, I have a profound appreciative envy of biochemistry, biology, physics, bio, you know, biological taxonomy, that despite, you know, lots and lots of decades of debate, we're able to come together and say, this is just useful language. We, we can get over most of our fundamental squabbles. We can just use, you know, standard mathematical notation. We can just say this is, you know, this plant genus and species or whatever. Same thing in biology, same thing in chemistry. And once they were able to do that, and it facilitated a revolution where people were getting over these sort of, you know, squabbling term wars of petty academics vying for control and looking at the global benefit that came when we said, okay, a plus sign is just a plus sign. Cool. I think we can do also do that for emergent phenomenology and um, projects like the effect index or the subjective effect index um, can help us with things like that.
It's also important that this be non-aligned and results neutral. So most attempts to do something like this over the past 120 years have been beholden to specific religious, spiritual, or professional movements. Um, the EPRC very specifically is not, right? We have lots of different people coming from all of their favorite um, traditions, you know, and, and yet we're all recognizing that to help people globally, we need to do something better than that. Not that all these traditions may not have their validity within their scope and scale and their cultural context, context excellent. But do we think that solutions that are coming out of very specific religions that have fought for however long they've been around are likely to scale globally and language? Um, realistically, no. And, and so something that is just more phenomenological, we think, is going to scale. And we're the first um, group that has really tried um, to take this as a, as a working pr hypothesis that this kind of a focus will make uh, our project much more likely to succeed. Also, being not particularly pro or con any tradition, um, not having financial incentives or cultural incentives, we want to just go into these looking at things very openly um, and report very cleanly on what is the good, what is the maybe not so good, where is there obvious room for debate about what is good and what is not so good, and what's the data show. This is also systematic, meaning we have a complete plan. And this complete plan involves beginning with the state-of-the-art project and continuing with many other projects that we think are necessary, and necessary based on the fact that all previous attempts to do them didn't have this. And we are now attempting something that we think is what we actually need to integrate these understandings, to come up with them and integrate them into the global world. So first, starting with the state-of-the-art project, what literature do we have access to across the traditions and among the traditions, looking at what is common, what is different, how is, you know, what practices, what uh, phenomenology, um, what is available in the contemporary literature coming from a whole host of fusion traditions in the transpersonal literature, in the secular, secular literature, in the world of microphenomenology, in fusion traditions and hybrids that people are experimenting and riffing on in contemporary psychedelic literatures. Just what is there? What is the state of the art? And what do we need to do? What's the evidence quality for each of these things? This in and of itself is a massive comprehensive literature. Um, people have done parts of it. Nobody has done all of it. And there's even new translation that needs to occur. Um, this is a big project to make sure that we are not missing useful thing from, things from the past and to make sure we also have a thorough, nuanced understanding of all of the gaps in our current understanding, what we need to do forward, such that we can make sure we are efficient and effective with resources given to us and that we don't need to replicate wheels, you know, or rebuild or rediscover wheels that have already been built. Um, the Theoretical Foundations Project, this is a multidisciplinary plan. We need to bridge gaps between symptomatology and phenomenology that have never really been bridged, between uh, religious descriptions, anthropology, um, uh, cultural uh, linguistics in a way that has not been bridged with sorry, non-secular and orthodox religious traditions. There's a lot of theoretical and conceptual bridges that need to come together and be built in ways they currently aren't. The Phenomenology Project is a first-person naturalist project looking at what is the range of how people describe those, both linguistically and what seems to be their essence. People say, I see a bright light, I see a bright bulb, I see, you know, a bright shining thing, you know, looking at what is seems to be the underlying commonalities of those and also the nuanced differences. Building that out with neurophenomenology, how can we image and have correlations between what we people are seeing and experiencing and feeling and those changes over time and how does that um, correlate with anything we can actually measure from an EEG, fMRI, etc a point of view, um, and then building those into a naturalistic taxonomies that hopefully have descriptive value um, related to their underlying physiology to the degree that we can measure what neurochemicals are involved, uh, what pathways are involved, what underlying proteins, receptors, sorry, genetics, epigenetics, etc., what can be modified, what seems to be structural, and what are the differences, why is it that some people given practices again and again and again don't seem to get very far, and other people given teeny doses of these practices are getting wildly into very, very complicated emergent territory, what's going on with that? I'm fascinated to know, as are lots of other people. Um, Looking at figure out how we have both static and developmental taxonomies, so an evolving taxonomy that can be in, incorporate new information and new data as taxonomies continue to evolve in the naturalistic world. Oh, these bacteria, we thought they were different. No, they're actually kind of the same family. Oh, we thought they were the same family, actually very different. 
um, that kind of thing. And developmental taxonomies, in terms of how these things unfold and what are the patterns of their unfolding over time as people do emergent practices or even don't, and to see what actually happens in living humans over you know, days, weeks, months, years, decades, over lifespans, and how that impacts their function in communities. The diagnosis project, what are reasonable categories for the things that seem to be pathological, um, that people do not seem to want, that are undesired, and can we have reasonable discussion around those? Um, management projects, when people decide, okay, we decide this is pathological, how do we then manage and or mitigate and or reduce and or avoid those kinds of things? What is the role of pharmacological interventions versus non-pharmacological interventions versus mixed modalities, neurointerventional, neuromodulatory, um, in terms of neurofeedback, um, even maybe direct modification stimulators, et cetera, these things you people put in people's brains as that technology evolves. Um, and, and how can we show that this hopefully adds value to care, helps improve functionality, and even, you know, what are the various possible ways we can look at what functionality one might optimize for and how that relates to people's particular um, goals and, and um, society's goals as well and where those interface. Obviously a complicated discussion. Cultivation projects, what are the best practices for optimizing desired effects? How can those be compared? We have this notion that just that there, there may be um, ways that prospective cultivation strategies can show that if this is your risk tolerance and this is what you want and this is what you value, that these are the practices most likely to lead to those things and how and be able to have good data so that clinicians and meditation teachers and clergy and other people who are doing these kinds of practices, uh, in, indigenous um, uh, shamans, uh, re realize I'm using the POP uh, notion of the word, not the specific one related to Siberia. Forgive me if that offends anybody. Um, figure out how we cultivate desired effects. And then the mental health project, where all these converge very specifically with the world of mental health, of psychiatry, of psychology, of all alternative mental health practitioners. And we come to the epidemiology project, which again, we have no idea of the incidence and prevalence of these in populations based on beyond a few population-based surveys that maybe this many people had seen a ghost or had a spiritual experience, whatever that means. Um, in certain populations, it's much larger than most people would think it is, but we don't really have good incidence or prevalence data on emergent effects because we don't even have good diagnostic criteria. Um, we also have profound uh, disincentives for people to disclose these kinds of things based on the taboos that is obviously highly unhelpful for public health or science. Um, we don't know the distributions of these across ages, religious, cultures, traditions. Um, across genetic clades. We don't have any idea about how to reasonably then allocate public health funding, um, dollars, infrastructure for supporting the possible, be possible beneficial outcomes of these, increasing human resilience and thriving or mitigating challenging effects that may be occurring in populations. We don't have any great sense beyond, you know, sort of hearsay and old traditions of a sense of what are the predisposing factors for good or bad outcomes, who are the people who should be doing intensive meditation practices or perhaps taking psychedelics, and how do you determine that, or how do people, given the information, make good choices of like, oh, that's too risky for me, or oh, I'm you know, comfortable with that risk profile, you know, for the potential benefits I might get. Again, we don't have good large, you know, large outcomes-based data to meet the basic criteria of informed consent at this point. And we need to, obviously. Um, predisposing factors, we already talked on a lot of these. We don't know how nurture and nature play into this, how trauma plays into this. Obviously, a huge topic I've barely touched on, but needs to be studied how culture, cultural factors and expectations play into promoting good or bad outcomes. Are there ontological frames or overlays that noticeably increase um, what might be thought of as beneficial outcomes? We've got to figure out how to globally incorporate this and measure the value of this. So how, what is up with psychedelics and how, how do we look at how they add value in a global way? Um, obviously, the, the relationship to psychedelics or psychoactive compounds um, has varied widely across cultures and has powerful political influence. And some of that politics was based on things about science. Oh, maybe LSD alters your genetics and causes genetic damage, or maybe these things lead to Alzheimer's, or maybe these things lead to paranoia or schizophrenia, or maybe whatever. 
or maybe these things heal depression. Maybe these things are profoundly, you know, transformative. Maybe the psychedelics even, you know, help make you a fully functional adult in some way, depending on their cultural context. If we look at, say, ibogaine, for example, and how it may be used in certain traditions in West Africa, you know, these important transitional ceremonies. Um, th this is something that obviously we have to think very carefully about from an anthropological point of view and, and to be appropriately culturally sensitive in a way that the previous traditions were not, in a way that uh, previous, when I say traditions, I mean um, basically imperialist, materialist traditions. Uh, we need to f have ma make sure we have people at the table involved in these conversations globally, that we are inclusive rather than exclusionary, that we think very much about how the major religions, how the smaller religions, how the fusion religions, how they can have a conversation around these things about what just helps everybody do what they do well and come out better. Um, this obviously plays directly into the com communications project. We need very sophisticated cultural linguists, medical linguists, people who have a sense of, of how terms ring to various cultural ears and what their baggage is in very much the way that people who do branding think about, oh, how does this, you know, this brand of a perfume or something scale across populations? We need that same sophisticated understanding so that we don't needlessly disenfranchise people by an unsophisticated use of language that then cuts them off from benefits that they themselves could have obtained. Um, and then we really need the value and impact projects. So what, what, as far as I can tell, nobody has done is really looked at the range of possible relationships to emergent phenomena, looking at them from an impact and value point of view, and really applying straightforward, well-accepted metrics such that at least those who care about these metrics can think, ah, this helps me or doesn't help me. This is what would be useful. This is what we can co incorporate if we're looking at this from a bottom line point of view or from a quality adjusted life years point of view. And then we need to think a lot about special populations. We need to think about kids. We need to think about pregnant women. We need to think about the wide range of neurodiversity um, I have often thought of myself and been thought of by others as being a touch neurodiverse. How does that play into um, uh, this globally? And what's the range of neurodiversity out there? And can we measure how these various techniques or frameworks or strategies might perform in various populations that may not all look or behave the same way, such that we can do something that is more tailored and specific to them, rather than just sort of a general broad pronouncements of, oh, we are certain that this ontological frame or this diagnostic or management strategy just works for everybody, which is how it's often um, operationalized in contemporary contexts. We need to think about the implications for military and paramilitary organizations, how to conversion experiences or emergent phenomena or dark nights or what we might call, you know, very challenging emergent phenomena or revolutionary or revelatory emergent phenomena impact those people who have their fingers on the buttons or control large weapon systems. And how can we, you know, relate very skillfully to the diagnosis and management of that or the cultivation of positive mental qualities, which hopefully we would want in these people rather than challenging or negative ones. Um, how does this relate to space and people going out um, into what clearly are very contemplative environments? We already know that the paradigm shifts that come from being in space uh, can be revolutionary and change how people look at things. What are the implications of that for multi-billion dollar space missions that might take months or even years, for example? And how can we have alternative strategies rather than just, you know, meds, shut it down and maybe cognitively impair these people rather than take advantage of potential beneficial opportunities for, you know, purported cognitive upgrades? Um, in critical systems, in you know, the power industry, in water, um, we need to understand how these critical infrastructure things may be impacted by people having strong um, reactions to emergent phenomena. What happens if our government leaders get into this territory? Are any of our current government leaders being impacted by religious or spiritual experiences that may have modified uh, how they relate to public policy issues or the use of the military, for example? Security, again, are these things identifiable in ways that we can lend value um, to people's outcomes and stay, save lives, hopefully, um, in ethical ways? What do in, does the intelligence community need to know about these things? And other powerful individuals, we now have people on the planet, individuals with the power of whole governments in terms of their economic or political influence. Um, 
how, what do we know about emergent phenomena and them, and how can we help them do well? We also need to know how we can utilize new things that we never had access to before. Speaking of new technologies, big data. So for example, big data, now we have unprecedented amounts of data of emergent phenomena being reported and able to hopefully be mined and utilized in ethical ways. Obviously, we need to treat that topic with a great degree of nuance. Obviously, people are using big data right now in some ways that I would consider extremely unskillful, and we need to do vastly better than that and have a lot of transparency, oversight, and nuanced discussions around these kinds of utilizations of this now unprecedented amount of data and how it relates to the world of people having good outcomes through emergence. The EPRC also wants to do this through a lot of centers. Currently, we have uh, the SEMA lab, Jay Sanguinetti. Um, there's Dave Vago, um, who's doing uh, research uh, related to this. Uh, we have a planned emergent research center, which I think should just be its own talk, uh, where we hope to do prospective um, longitudinal outcome studies in real time Im imaging of people doing very intensive practices. So we can have the latest of 24 hour available fMRI, EEG, um, linguistics data analysis, et cetera, and plenty of other centers that we want to uh, work with and build, such as at some major Ivy League universities that we can talk about later. Um, and again, hopefully all of this will lead to improved outcomes, improved ethics, which clearly is totally inadequate in the realm of emergent phenomena right now to make, meet basic ethical criteria, improve patient satisfaction, practitioner empowerment, to improve the efficacy of practices and their safety, to save resources, and improve fundamental relationship between science, religion, spirituality, clinical practice, and public understanding. Essentially, this is era change, and we think this we can do this for now. I don't know, $1.4 billion is our current estimate, something like that. Um, we think this is going to be a win-win-win situation for everybody because we are focused on what, what is a win for empowering healthcare practitioners to care for people better, to know more, to um, spiritual teachers, centers, institutions, healthcare systems, corporations, neurohackers, and brain tech to be, build critical infrastructure for good outcomes, to help cultures, religions, and patients and practitioners all do better. The advantages we have available now, vastly better imaging, computational laboratory technology, a vastly better plan, and a larger team than anybody has had before. We have huge data access that we have never had in the history of the world, a rare period of relative cultural acceptance of these things, vastly improved interest globally in real sources, and real existential threats and compelling reasons to do it now. Long term, this project will take decades, uh, requires generational change. Again, this is basically the fundamental change of an era in the same way that the medieval era was a change from the Axial Age or the Renaissance was a change from the medieval era. We think this will be a fundamental change from the sort of modern-y, late postmodern-y, um, et cetera, era that we're currently in. Um, and I have friends that basically go the sage approach, and I understand why they do. If the sage basically wanders lonely away from this and looks at the mainstream modern clinical mental health world as unworkable, intractable, unchangeable, greedy, bought and paid for, so best to keep quiet, closeted, cloistered, that this is just going to be a waste of money, that there's no way to reach these people, that the forces of industry are too powerful and and the, the ability of people to understand this is too insufficient, even with high-quality data. And yet, the EPRC takes the opposite approach of MAGE, who feels that you know people with understanding and capabilities need to be the positive change that they want to see in the world and want to work hard to understand and help the mainstream and public at large to have a detailed and sophisticated knowledge and be able to best help each other with, relation, with relationship to emergent phenomena. Um, we think that spirituality um, clearly relates to the global health crisis, that there are spiritual crises now as well as spiritual opportunities, um, that uh, the current crisis of climate crisis, nuclear resources, wars, etc., um, we think that, that emergent practices and transformations and mitigating of unfortunate effects or undesired effects um, has some role to play in current crisis management. However, we must admit that we are not entirely certain that something that takes decades can unfold over realistic timeframes that we need. Um, consequently, we feel a high degree of urgency right now to get these things done. Do we have decades before we blow ourselves to pieces or involved in major resource wars or whatever, or glo you know, global conflicts that spiral out of control? Uh, we don't know. 
So given that we think the iron is pretty hot for striking now, we think we should strike while the iron is hot. Um, and such, uh, we would urge you, if you think you can help the EPRC to do what we do, to reach out to us, um, to look at the EPRC website, theeprc.org. We think this will take hundreds of people. We think this requires global networking, maybe thousands of people. Um, we think this will currently take at least $1.4 billion. Um, we have a detailed map that you can see at Emergence Benefactors. And if you look at the EPRC site and the detailed white paper of both of these, you can see our, our roadmap and structure of what th we think this will take and why. Um, this will re require a global public dialogue and the facilitation of that in a skillful way with a lot of resources. Um, it is also more important that it gets done than exactly who does it. As long as this happens, I personally will be happy. Um, we don't necessarily have to do it, but we think we are the best uh, team currently positioned with the most detailed plan in the world currently to do this. Um, in terms of fundraising, yeah, the $1.3 billion or so we think this will uh, cost, please check out ebenefactors.org. You can go to the website and you can see what we think this will take. It might take more than that, but this is our current best guess to get us a serious shot of all of the plans and studies and things that I've just detailed. Um, we've assembled an unprecedented, massive, ta talented team. And so if you have any idea how to ethically and skillfully obtain the funds to do this, please let us know. Uh, we want to know what your best ideas are. We want to know what the problems with our current plan are. We want to know who you know that might help us help do this. Help us make this difference in the world for everybody experiencing emergent phenomena and everybody that might be impacted by them, even if they're not experiencing them. Thank you so much for listening to this. It is greatly appreciated. All right. Best wishes. Bye.